All right. Hello, hello. I wanted to introduce you to uh, lesson number three. Can you believe that? We are already week two. Um, so basically what I want to do is go over chapter three and uh, see where we can go um, with the knowledge from here. It is a foundational base and we will move on to uh, chapter four uh, later on this week. Um, it is only Tuesday, so I'm still grading um, your week one content. So uh, be patient with that. Um, however, um, hopefully you are well on your way with week two. So with that said, uh, with week two, we have this chapter, chapter three and chapter four. So I will do lesson for chapter three today. All right, so let's begin. Um, this is basically a journey in understanding the practical applications and how we um, can prevent infection in the medical world uh, based on all the microbes that we are familiar with. So let's get started. Um, this is the beginning of the chapter and you'll see this in the book. But remember, this PowerPoint is just a synopsis of the entire chapter. So just because I'm lecturing on it and I'm going over the PowerPoint, it's not enough. You need to go over the exercises as a reminder and also read through the chapter and take your own notes. You may also take notes here if you want. All right, so let's go over uh, medical microbiology. So um, as I started uh, last week, um, a discussion on what is the branch of medical microbiology. It is the study of microbes that is applicable to the disease states of mankind and how we can um, discover it in the clinical setting, treat it and eradicate it. So um, we can get the clinical setting, uh, we can get uh, viruses, we can get a fungus, we can get parasites. There are a variety of different type of organisms that one needs to be familiar with that's present in the environment and thus patients getting sick and presenting in a clinical setting. So virology is the study of viruses and there are specific um, specialties within the uh, microbiology world that you can um, get research and have a PhD just in studying viruses. So there's virology. Then there's also uh, mycology, which is the study of fungi. So a fungus is um, uh, very different structurally and in its way that it attacks individuals um, so we have to treat it from a different perspective than viruses. Parasitology, uh, there are many, and these are um, any kind of parasitic worms or um, kind of organisms that attach to tissue um, or get inside an organism and decide to set up shop, uh, replicate and uh, populate uh, inside the human and feeds off of the human or the animal and uh, potentially can destroy uh, cells, tissue, organs, organ systems and result in death. Okay, so um, I have a very um, uh, sensitive mouse. So I just touched the button and boof, I went forward. All right. So the next slide here goes over virology. What is the study of virology? As I mentioned, uh, viruses. So viruses, as we mentioned in uh, lecture one and two, um, they are dependent on living through a human being. So they can, or any kind of other animal cell. Okay, so human cell, an animal cell. All right, so it requires a host cell. So it's parasitic in nature as well, but much simpler than what um, the parasitic worms are, for example. All right, so what do we mean by um, the fact that it's an obligate parasite? It means that our immune system should eventually be able to destroy it. Uh, so it can't live for very long. So it needs to continuously um, find a different host. All right. So that's the main thing. It requires a host cell and it has a protein coat. And in the case of HIV, um, the protein coat may change 
um, so that it can fool the cell into thinking that it's not, you know, anything hostile or foreign. All right, so the protein code covers the strand of DNA and RNA. The protein code continues to mutate, and that is the problem that we're having with a variety of viruses, uh, including our COVID-19, as well as uh, the situation with the uh, yearly flu virus. There's every year, there's a different strain. All right, so any um, issues with um, viruses? Unfortunately, we don't have, like we have with bacteria, um, a very vast amount of antibiotics. We only have some viral antiviral agents that can slow down its viral replication, but we don't actually have anything to kill it other than our own immune system. And therefore, as a result, we have come up with um, vaccinations or specific va vaccines designed to boost your immune system in order to kill the viral cells. All right. Now, the virus can be um, RNA, DNA. RNA viruses are the most common. These uh, examples would be uh, the flu virus, um, also polio. Um, also, additionally, I would mention um, HIV, uh, rabies, now, with respect to the DNA virus, um, the common cold, so, you know, it enters through your nose. You don't really get as sick as influenza. Um, either way, um, you get sick enough, and it is a DNA virus. Cold sores, like the herpes simplex 1 that's found on your lips, genital warts, herpes simplex 2, um, these are all DNA viruses. The transmission is either direct or indirect contact. Direct contact through uh, air droplets um, with, uh, with the actual virus or indirect like a fomite. All right, now the virus can um, exhibit signs of low-grade fever, muscle ache, general fatigue, um, and usually the first 48 hours, it's really significant. <laughs> Excuse me allergies, not sick. Um, and also um, some people can be asymptomatic and, and still get uh, some sort of a virus. All right, so what's the treatment for getting a viral infection? Universally across the board, whether it's you know a simple cold or whether it's the flu or COVID-19, we manage um, the uh, sickness through us, fluids and palliative treatment to boost the, uh, to give the immune system a chance uh, to fight the virus. Okay, so how do we prevent infection mainly is vaccination. Vaccination, vaccination, vaccination. And uh, the population today uh, may have been, um, you know, I don't like to use the word brainwashed, but, you know, ill-informed, shall we say, to have this um, hysteria and fear over vaccines, but we've been using it for over a century and vaccines have saved many lives in the past with respect to all the different other diseases that came in the past. And now we have a new one, COVID-19. And yeah, you know, there is evidence that it works. So I'm not gonna get into it now, but um, vaccinations across the board universally, uh, the purpose is to create um, a product that is going to boost the immune system to be able to fight the infection. All right, that is the simple way to explain it. I'm not gonna go into the genetics of it at this time. Um, we're just doing the basics. We're only on chapter three. All right, so. Let's go over the classification. Uh, we classify viruses not only by whether they're DNA or RNA, um, we also classify them based on the severity, the length of time that it's present, what body organs it affects and the sites that it affects. We identify it by culture, direct detection. We have multi-pathogen detection systems and diagnosis of the serum, serodiagnosis as we call it. Now, antiviral therapy is not curative. It is palliative. In other words, it lessens the severity. It is not a cure. 
All right, um, just so you know, there's never really truly a cure. We manage everything. So medicine is always about managing uh, a particular disease, okay, or infection, but it doesn't cure anything, okay? Uh, it can resolve it, but of course it may come back, all right? There's no cancer cure. We can cause cancer to go in remission if we were able to eradicate most of the cancer cells or completely eradicated the cancer cells. That doesn't mean that it can't come back. Same thing with viral infections. Yes, you had an infection. Yes, you had the vaccine to boost you through it. And yes, you can get COVID again, for example, and again, and again, and again, each time it mutates, all right? So we treat viruses um, such as respiratory syncytial virus, RSV. We can treat viruses like HIV, which turns into AIDS if it's uh, untreated with antiviral therapy and replicates out of hand. It can bring the T cell count to 500, then it's full-blown AIDS. You can have hepatitis C, which is um, an infection that uh, can be caught through um, uh, sexual contact and uh, contamination of blood, such as IV drug use, sharing of needles. Uh, we can also treat viruses, for example, SARS, which is a severe acute respiratory syndrome. Under that umbrella, there is a huge umbrella of viruses. Viruses can be very severe. The first one I'm going to go over is RSV. It causes bronchiolitis and pneumonia. It's very common in younger children, major cause of acute respiratory disease. The treatment is ribavirin and it inhibits the essential DNA formation, the nucleic acid formation, and therefore eventually will prevent its replication and it will die. So the obligate parasite virus dies eventually. So we can quicken the process for the patient and this way the patient can be spared the morbidity and mortality of RSV. Now, let's talk about AIDS. HIV is a retrovirus. What it does is it has an enzyme that can uh, take its DNA and um, insert itself into the DNA of the human being. Every time the T cell replicates then, um, or the cell replicates, um, it will continue to replicate throughout the body. The CD4 count or T helper cell is what we're talking about. If it gets to under 200, then we have full-blown AIDS, okay? So again, we don't cure HIV, but a person can now have a pretty long life with um, a plethora, of, a cocktail or a plethora of antiviral agents that we utilize to maintain uh, a healthy lifestyle that can preclude the full-blown AIDS um, stage or prevent, not preclude. All right, hepatitis C, HCV. This can be asymptomatic when it becomes acute. Um, it progresses uh, very rapidly. You can have chronic hepatitis C, which of course can progress to liver cirrhosis or even liver cancer. There are six genetically distinct types of hepatitis C virus and the genotype one through four are most difficult to treat. All right. So let me just adjust this so you can see me full head. There we go. All right, China, I'm the OCD person that wants to, have, wants to have the perfect frame behind me. I hope you like the forest. <laughs> it's a mural I have in my house. I think it's nice. Um, so anyway, moving on. The next uh, discussion is uh, SARS. SARS is acute respiratory syndrome. Uh, again, a huge umbrella of viruses under SARS. It causes fever, headache, body aches, dry cough. It spreads through respiratory droplets. And this has a higher mortality rate. Uh, the mortality rate is 30% of those who are infected can die. That's a huge number. So 70% of people get better, but 30% of people can die. All right, this one, oh my gosh. This one um, puts people up at night, doctors and nurses, keeps us up at night. Uh, when I was in practice, uh, we didn't come across it, 
However, when I was out of practice, I left practice in 2012. And in 2014, I was in full mode, full time professor at a nursing school, Herzing University. And um, the scare was out and uh, students were freaking out. Everyone was freaking out. Um, my husband was working the ER, so it was a scary time. It was contained, but one person did bring it to the United States. And thankfully the doctor was uh, saved with the use of um, antibody therapy. So uh, they took the antibodies from an infected person um, and those antibodies were injected right away into the individual and the individual uh, lived. However, uh, this has like, <laughs> you die. You basically get this infection, you die. Uh, you bleed out through all your orifices. That's the end result. Um, the fever is high, the sore throat is bad, but really what's the worst part is the muscle pain, the headache, the terrible diarrhea, vomiting and bleeding will cause you to lose all your fluids and die because you'll become hypovolemic, meaning the volume of blood is so low that that will drop your blood pressure. Once the blood pressure drops, you go into shock, your heart rate stops and boom, you, you die. So high mortality rate, the reason being dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, kidney failure, liver failure, and then multi-system failure, hypotension, and then heart stops. How do you do uh, treatment for this kind of infection? Well, you hope that they survive it. You do the antibiotic therapy, uh, the antibody therapy, not antibiotic, because we don't have anything. This is, you know, a virus. So antibody therapy, immunoglobulin therapy, I should say, um, <clears throat> oral rehydration, but most of all, the IV fluids is what is going to help uh, prevent the severe dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. Of course, you hope that the hypotension doesn't set in. Uh, so you definitely want to do, you know, open IV, KVO and do the IV fluids as needed. Moving on to parasitology, the study of parasites. Um, they can be unicellular or multicellular uh, organisms that live in a host. They exist in body areas. Uh, some love to kind of circulate in your blood. Some love to enter through your skin and remain under your skin. Um, we have three main classes, protozoa, helminths, and ectoparasites. We identify them based on their name. Um, how we name them is based on how they develop, um, what they develop, like do they develop cysts? Do they have ova? Um, what is their development stage? So they go through specific stages of development. So we can identify them through those different stages of development. So how do they feed and grow? So that's called trophozoite. Um, are they dormant? If they're dormant, they're in the cystic stage and then they become active when the cyst opens. Um, they may have eggs that can hatch. Larvae are the hatched eggs, yuck. And the adult version of these parasites could be like, you know, worms like tinea. Uh, there, there's, there's so many, but um, the, the first one that I can think of is, is tapeworm. Um, and it looks like linguine, it enters um, through infected meat, and then it just sets up shop in your intestines and eventually takes over. It starts to uh, consume the energy that you consume, so the patient is going to want to eat more and more. It's, it's very interesting um, how this parasite works. All right, now, uh, protozoa. This is a microscopic one, very favorable to humans. It can, it, it can be, uh, this, this happens a lot if you go to Mexico and there's contaminated water. Of course, most areas of Mexico now have their water filtered and everything, but in um, a, rural areas, the water may be contaminated. So um, anyway, you can uh, get these, um, protozoa through a contaminated water. You can actually see them swimming in the water and uh, you know certain uh, people, indigenous people uh, that grew up there know that and they actually can use a strainer to get rid of the uh, worms. Uh, sounds disgusting, but 
you do what you got to do. Um, it, they also, the protozoa can penetrate through skin and the worst part of all, and this is the scariest part of all, especially when you go to tropical countries. And that also can include being in areas like, um, you know, Southern Florida, <laughs> insect bites. All right. Um, they, the insect bites, the bite of the insect, that's the um, transmission, but the insect is carrying the protozoa. All right. So um, anyway, symptoms vary according to the type of the protozoa. Um, a very common one is called Guardia, which is a parasite in the GI tract. A transmission is from food or water. So like, let's say you ate a fruit that you didn't wash and it had some, some of this. Um, it, your, your first symptom is within two hours. And unfortunately, I've had this. I ate a fruit on a farm. Um, terrible bloating, watery, explosive diarrhea, foul smelling, nausea, vomiting, abdominal gas, cramps, all of that. And really, the only thing is to uh, ride it out 72 hours, but usually 48 hours, you, sh you should be feeling better. Um, if it gets really bad, you need IV fluids um, and, uh, you know, electrolyte replacement and antimicrobials. Uh, what I always recommend is start off before you go on to antimicrobials, uh, go get the live culture or eat yogurt and that should help if you can stomach the yogurt. Of course, if you have nausea, you may not be able to. So uh, maybe get the live culture capsules and that might do it. All right, malaria. Malaria is very common. Um, unfortunately, people think it's only in tropical countries um, such as, uh, you know, South America, Africa, uh, Middle East and India and parts of, you know, Asia, but you can get it in the Mediterranean area as well. And of course, if there's war-torn areas, malaria can, um, uh, you know, expand, especially if the war is happening in the summertime. So I'm thinking right now, Ukraine. Um, so anyway, uh, malaria, how, how does it happen? The mosquito bite transmits the uh, parasite plasmodium it mimics the flu, severe fever, chills, and of course, if it's untreated, death. Diagnosis, a microscopic examination of the blood of the infected patient, and it's very easy to identify. The treatment with species um, and geographical area is, is very specific. So in other words, um, there are different species of malaria, so you need to know the geographic area that the person got infected from so that you can have the appropriate um, antimicrobial. All right, so um, now the next one is helminths. These can be viewed on gross examination. Gross, yuck, <laughs> because you don't need a microscope to find these helminths. Um, they survive in nature or in humans. These are the worms, the tapeworm that I was talking about. They look like little linguine. Now you're never going to eat linguine again, but um, it looks like, um, uh, you know, a worm. And some of them uh, are called flukes because they're flat. And then there's round worms or uh, they can be hookworms because it has a hook and pin worms. Horrible. I'm not going to show you pictures. You can Go on YouTube and plenty of that to, uh, and there's even a video of a surgical removal of tapeworms. <laughs> if you can stomach it, uh, thousands of tapeworms. Well, I, I'm exaggerating, probably hundreds, definitely hundreds of tapeworms in this guy's uh, 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 large intestine, small intestine, all because he was uh, eating sushi every day and managed to eat a bad batch of sushi and then got infected. All right, so tapeworm uh, cannot just be um, ingested from sushi. You can get it from improperly cooked beef or pork. The symptoms are abdominal pain, nausea, loss of appetite, sickening thought. There are people that do uh, a particular diet where they just ingest a small amount of tapeworm, which then uh, makes them eat less, and then the tapeworm uses up their energy and they lose weight. Kind of crazy, right? Now, what happens if you don't treat the tapeworm? It can cause blindness, seizures, because it gets into the nervous system, and then death. The treatment is an anti-parasitic medication called Prasquintel or Niclosamide. 
All right, next one is hookworm. Hookworm is acquired by walking barefoot everywhere in fecally contaminated soil. Not the best thing to do. So don't walk uh, barefoot on a farm, not a good idea. It resides in the host GI system. Um, the signs and symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, possible nutritional deficiencies, anemia. The treatment is albendazole. This is the drug of choice. There's another variation of it, mebendazole, but basically these are the antiparasitic medications. Pinworms. Pinworms can be small round worms, very often in children and institutionalized individuals, uh, you know, uh, severely mentally challenged individuals, children and adults in a home that uh, takes care of um, uh, individuals in large groups, and it's very uh, common. Now, how does how do, how do you diagnose it? Uh, these patients will frequently complain of anal itching, and they do a tape test, and yes, the pinworm comes out at night, and it gets stuck to the tape, and voila, you have discovered the pinworms. Again, albendazole, mebendazole, it requires a prescription, but it'll do the job. You do have over-the-counter uh, medications as well, Parental Pimoate is a over-the-counter medication. Now, ectoparasites are external uh, parasites with hard segmented bodies. They feed on humans and animals. Uh, the transmission of this disease is through fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. Um, so you can also get bed bugs, uh, very common, unfortunately. And these bed bugs are present in uh, areas uh, that are not clean, public um, places like dirty hotels, things like that. It's scary to think of. All right, next, the study of mycology, which is the study of fungus. Remember that I talked about spores. These are the um, kind of like a shell that protects them. And that's why it's hard to kill them. You could do oral antifungals but it may not kill if it's in the spore form, the, uh, and the antifungal will not work. So uh, yeast infections is very common, vaginal yeast infections in women. Uh, Candida albicans is the uh, yeast. Um, people who are HIV positive can get yeast in their mouth. Um, you can get mold infections. Um, you can inhale the mold, which is, can give brain damage. Um, and, and other very severe, severe symptoms, allergies, of course, and um, even like hallucinations um, from um, a black mold. All right, so um, they have uh, ergosterol instead of cholesterol in the human cells, um, so we can destroy them through antifungal therapy that way. Um, the destruction of the body's natural flora uh, through the use of antibiotics to kill an, a bacteria may lead to opportunistic fungal infections like candida albicans, which is the yeast. This is why we tell women, if you're on an antibiotic, eat yogurt or do the uh, supplement, uh, which is the live culture in a capsule, which needs to be refrigerated. All right, now, fungi, fungus, fungus among us. So we talked about yeast. Fungus uh, will only uh, take over in a human body if the patient is immunocompromised, such as HIV positive. How do you identify it? Through microscopic observation or biochemical testing. The transmission, you can actually get it through inhalation, ingestion of the spores, and through non-contact um, skin, non-intact skin, I should say, not non-contact, sorry. So like an open wound you can get the fungus. Fungus is an opportunistic organism. The signs and symptoms may vary according to location on the host. Now, yeast, as I mentioned earlier, um, very common uh, opportunistic organism in the mouth and in the vagina because it's an open area and it's warm, dark, moist, and that uh, the mucous membrane uh, it is a perfect media for the yeast to grow. And that's why um, if you have a urinary tract infection, you're on an antibiotic, but then you end up with a candida albicans yeast infection in the vagina area. Well, that's because of the fact that the opportunistic organisms took over because the antibiotic killed the good bacteria 
as well as the bad bacteria. So candida needs to be kept in check. Um, it may cause a local mucous membrane infection. If it gets in the blood, it can be life-threatening and cause multi-system organ infection. So it's not to be treated lightly. If you think you have it, you need to get it treated, okay? If you think you have candida in the mouth, it looks like oral thrush. You'll see patches, white patches in the mouth. Make sure you have a healthcare practitioner identify it properly because it could also be something else like strep throat. So you don't know, okay? But anyway, yeast, got to get it treated. All right. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about is prions. Prions are the most simplistic um, structures. I wouldn't even call them organisms. They don't have nucleic acid. They're resistant to routine sterilization techniques because they're very, very small in number, but together they actually cause disease. Um, it infects the nervous system and the five related diseases in humans, Kruschfeldt jacobs uh, disease, a variant of Kruschfeldt jacob disease, gershman straussler schenker syndrome, and then fatal familial insomnia and Kuru, which uh, was discovered through an indigenous tribe in Australia that was eating the brain tissue of their loved ones after death and the prions were present in there. Long story, it was a cultural thing. Um, they felt that by eating the brain, they would take on the soul of that human and continue to have the memories of that individual. Anyway, let's go on to Kruschfeld jacobs disease. It is a worldwide disease, usually fatal within one year of the diagnosis. Signs and symptoms, dementia, difficulty walking, uh, loss of balance, myoclonus. Uh, diagnosis is based on signs and symptoms. The definitive diagnosis is biopsy. You do a brain biopsy and get the tissue sample and you can diagnose the disease. Again, it's all due to these prions. Now, to summarize our last 25 minutes of this discussion, we went over viruses and the viral species and how they infect. We went over parasites and, and how they infect. And we have come to the conclusion and understand that both viruses and parasites require a host, a host cell, host tissue, host organs. Virology is the study of viruses and viruses uh, will cause uh, infection by injecting their genetic material through a protein coat that is allowing itself to enter the cell because of endocytosis. The protein coat is not recognized by the cell as foreign. So RSV, AIDS, and SARS we discussed in detail. So please read the chapter in detail um, so that you have a full knowledge and analysis of these diseases. Parasitology is the study of parasites, as we mentioned, also needs a host. It could be a unicellular or multicellular organism living in or on the host itself. Examples are protozoa, malaria, and pinworms. Now, the final topic was, of course, fungi, and then we moved on to prion. So uh, fungi was the fact that they can have spores and lay latent and completely not have any um, uh, activity in the system until it activates. So we talked about this, this, this rigid spore, but also the fact that fungi can have a rigid cell wall, no chlorophyll. And so it, it is kind of hard to treat, right? So these are the yeasts, all right? Prions were the very small subparticles that can cause CJD, and fungal infections are likely to develop in immunocompromised patients, including HIV. All right, so with that, I end this lesson for today, and tomorrow I will go on to chapter four. I do hope you enjoyed this lesson. I'll see you tomorrow.